So uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, what's your you know your process for like two handed and one handed? First of all, do you switch between them, or if you do one session one handed, it, it's gonna be religiously one handed, and and then you do one that is two handed, or how is it? Yeah, right now, I mean, I just do whatever I feel like, which is usually two handed, since I don't want to really mess with my one handed cube that much. But in the past, when I was you know actively practicing, it would typically be. Um, warm up first two-handed and get like a quick 50 to 100 solves of two-handed in just to make sure you know i'm maintaining maybe getting a bit faster and also doing a lot of two-handed would just warm me up for one-handed since then my brain is used to working really quickly since my two-handed tps is faster and then once i start doing one-handed it's it just feels like it's slow motion and i just have to focus on turning so oh, nice. uh i'd essentially use three by three or two handed as a, as a quick warm up and just to get some solves in. And then I'd focus the rest of the session purely on one handed. Nice. nice. Um, what I wanted to ask. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Some. No. So I have a kind of another topic, but it's, uh, you know, uh, outside of the people that are uh, a bit older, I think that you're best known for your tutorials, I think, uh, and uh, and I wanted to ask first of all, how do you manage to make to make them that good? Uh, how much did you prepare? How much were you thinking about the way in which uh, you know you would structure the the things that you were explaining? How many reshoots did you do? Uh, <laughs> and this kind of thing, you know, all all the things that go behind the scenes just to explain. Today, there's a lot of people who are, are excited about cubing. They might want to do some tutorials. They want to create them. And the quality is not exactly always the same, even though they have fantastic cameras, super lightning, uh, uh, etc. But like the content doesn't seem to be uh, at the same level. Uh, what is the process? You know, deciding to do it, then thinking about doing it, and then the execution. How, how did it go? Yeah, well, thanks so much for uh, your kind words about my tutorials. I didn't realize uh, I didn't realize that people thought they were that good, but. Uh... I guess the the short answer and the cop out answer is that it depends on the video. Sometimes I'll just sometimes I'll have a topic that I just want to talk about or that people seem to be, you know, having misconceptions or difficulties with. And I'll just want to clear that up and I'll just throw on the camera and just talk about it while showing a few cases. Um, and other times I'll really have to think about, you know, how what the process would be for someone to learn it. I'll like make a, a quick document with like an outline of what I want to go over. Sometimes I'll write out like specific sentences I want to say. Sometimes I'll just put bullet points of like points I want to hit and then I'll go through them in that way and just, you know, let the thoughts flow. Um, in the past, I used to do a lot more preparation and editing in terms of, you know, laying out the outline, uh, thinking about the order in which I want to present, what cases I want to show, um, the pace I want to present it at, and then also making sure I have cases ready on different cubes to, you know, pause the recording, restart the recording, you know, edit, put things back to back when needed. Um, that sort of thing I used to do a lot in the past, but you know, over the years, I, I guess as I moved away from teaching the beginner things to the more advanced things, uh, there was a bit less preparation needed on my part. Um, but yeah, in terms of like refilming and that sort of thing, I don't think I I needed to refilm that that often. Typically, I take it first take and go with it. Um, some videos would take a lot of work. Some videos not so much. I could spend you know two three hours filming something and ten hours editing it. Or I could just oh, well. throw it on for 15 minutes and then send it, and that would be it. Um, but I think one thing that really helped is discussing it with other people. Uh, like my Rue tutorial was heavily informed by Dan White's Rue tutorial. Uh, I ended up using kind of a similar a similar format and similar teaching style to that. And then I just you know talking to Yuri and Kevin back in the day helped me, I guess, make it a little bit better. And same thing, even for like EOLR, uh, Yuri helped me with a lot of that in terms of putting everything together and thinking about how to how to present it and how to teach it. Um, so we, we just kind of discussed things. And once it made sense to us and we taught it to ourselves, we laid it out kind of the same way that we had learned it. And that's how it came about. Okay, yeah. For the latest videos, and I've watched those, like the, I think it, it was more the advanced stuff. Do you just pick up a camera and like those um live get togethers just go with the scramble and solve it or do you prepare something special usually i'll just so i did a couple of videos over christmas this year i think where it was just a hundred really advanced example yeah. solves where i just went as yeah. fast as i could i just went with the first hundred scrambles i got oh but really? i think there was 
there was another there was another video where I I like specifically handpicked five scrambles. I did just like a session of a hundred solves and then wrote down which solves had cool solutions and then revisited them. Um but yeah, so I, I do a bit of both, but generally yeah, for the advanced stuff, there's less preparation. I just kind of go with whatever. How much do you reshoot? Like, you know, like stop, redo it, stop, redo it, or just go with it and flow? Yeah, I don't think I've historically I haven't reshot at all. Um, I'll just go with the, the first try. For this last oh. video uh, that was talking about EOLR versus EOLRB, I reshot that maybe like eight times just because I kept saying the wrong one or just not being clear <laughs> enough. So I wanted to make sure I'm, you know, making that distinction as, as crystal clear as possible. But in general, I'll just go with the first take. Wow. <laughs> And, uh, follow up the, a bit to that is, you know, how much does it help others and how much does it help you like to be laid out? Is it something that helps you as well uh, understand things more clearly, et cetera? Or is it something that Only once you've understood it clearly, et cetera, do you feel at ease to, you know, pick up the camera and, and explain? Or it's kind of, let's wing it, and I'll, I'll kind of realize it as I go. Uh, I think a bit of both, depending on what the technique is for a lot of things, whether it's, you know, like influencing second block or that sort of thing that's kind of difficult. I had to, like, learn it fully to the best of my abilities before I could explain it. But for more, algor like, not necessary algorithmic, but uh, more obscure things, at least in my mind, for LSE, Uh, like EOLR and EOLRB, I essentially made the tutorials as a way of forcing myself to learn it. Um, no. Yeah, so I realized like, let's okay. Let's all I, the cases and then see what you Yeah, let me, let's figure out all the cases so I can make a video about it and then convince myself to learn it all. Nice. Very nice. Not just learn it, like be at a level where you can teach it. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. How much of your study do you like use the same working or learning method did you use from cubing because what you're describing is something that I used to do when I was a student I we usually had get together as a students one would learn one chapter and had to teach others and by teaching you need to be at a certain level you know there are this kind of uh, learning methods how much did you use from what you learned from cubing at, at yeah school? I think I think the way I learned at school is pretty similar to cubing as well, since, you know, when I got into cubing, it was 2014. And then that's also the year I started high school. Um, so I kind of got to like learn in parallel. And in yeah. high school, we had, you know, similar to what you're describing, or I was at a pretty competitive high school, everyone would be like asking, did you learn this yet? Did you learn that yet? Did you, can you, can you tell me about this? So kind of just by being at school, we'd just be discussing things and explaining it back and forth to each other. Uh, that helped a lot. Um, which is kind of similar with cubing uh, in terms of, you know, the Roo community I was surrounded by at the time. Uh, whereas when I started university and then uh, when I started, you know, learning a bit more advanced things in terms of EOLR and just kind of the finishing touches on my, on my Roo solving techniques, uh, the technique kind of changed. So in school, I started doing this thing where uh, instead of, you know, reading notes over and over again, I would read notes for maybe 25% of the time. And the rest of the time I'd stare at the wall and see if I could recite the whole course from memory. Oh, wow. Or like, just see if I could like teach the entire lecture or the entire chapter just by staring at the wall as if I was like teaching it to a class and just visualizing it in my head. That's um, impressive. Whereas for like, you know, cubing, it would be more, can I just do all the EOLR cases without looking at anything rather than just, you know, sitting at the document and looking at all the cases all over again. making sure it's in muscle memory and, and everything. Because yeah, or even I've just like your... seeing the case and knowing, you know, how the pieces move to get it to the to what I want it to be. Yeah, I've seen your Instagram account and the amount of research papers that you read, like I was, wow, wow. <laughs> like watching just the, the amount of research is not the actual what you read is, is like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think my, my reading papers is similar to my cubing in that sometimes I don't read for a couple of days, then I just sit down and go through like 20 to 30 papers for a couple hours and then uh, that'll, that'll carry me through for a couple of days. Yeah, and it's not just text, like it's, it's things that you need to analyze and understand. It's not really impressive. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's funny you bring that up. I was actually just reading papers before we started the call. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you because, I mean, you've been there from the beginning, right, of Roo as a method and not just a, a funky idea from a guy from France. 
Um, mm -hmm. how, how have you seen things develop? And because one thing that I find interesting is that, you know, the new generation, we always talk about the new generation. And the thing is, nobody who's really young does rule. Mm -hmm. At least uh, I, I've not seen a lot of them. It kind of appears only after a while. So you start. Yeah, you start Sean was the young one, but he's not that young anymore. He's not that, that young anymore, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so it's, have you seen things develop in the sense of, you know, people, more people arriving from CFOP instead of people just picking up the cube and, you know, let's learn. And so I pick up a method, something like that. Does that influence having camps of the, the, the former CFOPers versus the OG rule? Uh, how is it? Yeah, I, I don't think I've noticed. I, I don't think I've observed enough in recent years to be able to, to comment on that just because I've been kind of on and off active since 2019. And even you, you, whatever I perceive is going to be very different from what it is on a world scale. Um, at you know local competitions in in the Ontario area, I you know there's a couple of Rue solvers or younger kids who looked up to me back in the day and decided to learn Rue because of me. Uh, so that might be just because of where I'm situated and you know the influence I've had around me, and also from just seeing comments on YouTube saying, especially my uh, my like beginner Rue tutorial. A lot of people that's been there the first time they've ever solved the cube, they, they'll say that they tried with, you know, beginner method or standard CFOP and they just weren't able to wrap their heads around it. And they just found my tutorial and just stuck with Rue from there. Um, so I've seen a lot of cases of that. But, you know, I've also seen a lot of cases of people getting stuck at 20 seconds with CFOP and uh, especially older solvers not being able to turn faster, not wanting to learn algorithms. They'll just yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> switch to Rue and then get to like 12 or 15 seconds and that'll that'll be great for them. But uh, in terms of like the old generation just sticking with Rue from the start and the new generation you know, sw switching from CFOP, it's really hard to say. Um, I do think the 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 fast Rue solvers now mostly were were fast with CFOP first before switching to Rue. Um, Fami, yeah, even even Sean as well, Dwayne too. They were pretty decent with CFOP still before switching. Hmm. Okay. How fast do you expect someone who switches from CFOP to Rue to be, as, assuming he'll be as efficient as? <laughs> so it, it uh, uh, it's hard to say because I could say, oh, they'll be faster if you assume the same TPS, but yeah, it, uh, they, you can be under the same TPS. I mean, yeah. you mentioned Fami and and Sean being faster or decent at CFOP, and they switched, and they are well, they are crazy fast, you know. Yeah. <laughs> how much do you think that it influenced it because we've seen in the table before for example for sean that he's using more of a first block type that resembles cfop or the spam um yeah maybe i'm trying to convince myself to go into <laughs> yeah i'd say it depends like a lot of people say that you know you should go with whatever method makes you more excited to practice because in the long term you'll practice more and get faster um, I'm sure there are individual differences in terms of, you know, the way people's brains and hands work and what method will just be objectively faster for them. Uh, there's also maybe an objective difference in, you know, the max possible human speed with each method. I made like a, a seminar on that back in the day, just kind of breaking it down yeah, based on what I, would theor what I would theorize. Um, but at the end of the day, for most people, the, the objective difference in the method's potential is going to be pretty small, at least for three by three. But I think for one-handed, everyone would be faster with Rue. Okay. Um, it's just, I think it's a completely different ballgame with one-handed. So I think from CFOP switching to Rue, if, assuming you practice the same amount, uh, you'll end up faster with Rue. Whereas one, uh, three by three, it'll, it'll just end up being whichever you tend to prefer more or be a little bit more comfortable or confident with. You spoke a lot about composure here and there about being stressed and messed up how how and if you deal with composure at all i mean not just cubing yeah so that's obviously something i struggled with a lot in cubing since you know i never did the best at competitions and i had to work a lot on it to get better especially since i didn't have the opportunity to compete that often uh but i think it was mainly only affecting me in cubing uh just because you know it was oh. such high stakes in terms of like I can break a record. I can become a world yeah. champion. I can, I've been practicing for eight months for like four hours a day. So I have to perform now or it's just kind of a waste. You know, I've traveled all this way. I have to, the time yeah. is now. So it'd be kind of a lot of pressure. 
and not as much experience as like other people in terms of, you know, how many big competitions I've been to or that sort of thing. So, you know, I did a lot of preparation uh, things in terms of doing competition simulation at home, uh, just doing each average of five kind of separated from the rest and not thinking about long averages, you know, standing yeah. up between solves, uh, developing a kind of routine of like warm up cube, then, then normal cube, and then like just getting it, everything automatic, which, okay, camera on, warm up cube, do a full solve, just focus on like fluid turning. So there's a lot of like habits I developed to make myself perform better over the years. But yeah, it was mainly just cubing that it, it, it would be an issue. And, you know, mainly because the stakes were so high and it's just so sensitive to nerves, right? Typically when you're nervous, the nerves kind of help you, whether it's an athletic performance or anything like that. It, it helps you with focus. It helps you with kind of getting blood to the muscles, that sort of thing. Um, whereas with cubing, the moment your hands start shaking a little bit, uh, oh. it's kind of game over. You can't really think clearly. You can't inspect clearly. So uh, it's kind of the the opposite of most other things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it seems to be kind of a running joke, uh, the, the question of choking at comps for Russo. Yeah. Where so we're discussing <laughs> with Fami, with Anto, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's something that seems to be uh, popping up quite often. I think also because because it's Rue, there seems to be an added pressure that is, you know, could be the first Rue world record or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And yeah, so the, did you feel that? Or... Yeah, so as you brought that up, I was thinking of how many possible reasons there are for Rue solvers to have more issue with comp nerves. And you just gave me one, which is like the added Rue pressure of everyone expecting the Rue solver yeah. to, you know, being the first Rue this, the first Rue that. Oh, you know, you're so you, you claim OH is so nice, but uh, let's let's see it now, right? So there's that, right? There's the Rue pressure. There's the Rue solvers not competing as much in general. Uh, someone like Fahmi competed, competes even less than I did. So. Uh, you know, a comp for him is like once, twice a year, once a year. So even more pressure from that. So the root pressure, the not competing often, which is just a trend. Uh, also kind of the, the in intuitive aspect of the method makes it a, lit, a bit more hard to pull off in competition. If you panic during inspection, you're not going to have a good time. And, you know, finishing the solve with LSE, unless it's, it's your strong step, uh, then you're you're going to have a hard time. So that's probably why I did worse than a lot of people. A lot of people have strong LSEs so they can finish strong without an issue, but I will panic and mess up my LSE very often. Uh, that's three. There were a couple more I could think of that I just forgot. I think that at least with Rue, if you mess up on like CFOP, like instead of something to the wrong slot or OLL or something like that, if you mess up, you mess up. Yeah. Like I've seen the world record reconstruction, there was a point where you messed up. You know what? I, it was the fourth solve, I think. And, and if I messed like, up, it would have been solve four, the 15. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like things like that. My uh, my U.S. Nationals 2018, the Salt Lake City one, out of my five solves, three of them didn't have a first block. <laughs> what? <laughs> they were like missing an edge or like corner twisted in place or just like I just panic oh, wow. and inspect incorrectly and then just not have a first block. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you can say that about having a cross at least. Okay, I messed up a pair and like do with, uh, we're going to have a podcast with Juliet to insert it into the wrong slot and they get, then get an OLL skip. But yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah I think, and, that, and was, I think that was mainly just a me problem. I don't think many other people have that issue. <laughs> no, but I, I think that it's true that if you take CFOP, there's a big chunk of it that is basically, I mean, look ahead because you want to, to to predict and to to flow in faster to the next steps but then basically it's algorithmical and it's you know even if you're panicking you can choke a bit on the execution but basically it's going to be that yeah you don't pause because you don't know what you do uh, it's, yeah it's a it's, little more automatic yeah, and, yeah. And so i think that, the the other factor in that is kind of solving style i know uh timon talks about this quite a bit where like there's cfop so, there's cfop solvers that solve with a more roo style a more like slow intuitive kind of efficiency focus like yeah. he himself does a lot of weird tricks and turns slower than people that are his speed whereas there's some people that just spam a lot more so i think people who spam tps are going to be uh less prone to messing up in competition since they can just go with their their autom automatic drilled things whereas people who are a bit more efficiency dependent are going to have a bit harder time until they figure that out um, so you know there's there's cfop solvers that suffer from that but it just seems that Rue, obviously being the more efficient and intuitive method, is going to be more likely to cause that problem for more people. 
on average at least. on average yeah mm -hmm. yeah pun intended uh, yeah <laughs> so about that it, am i mistaking or are there less skips on Roo? like you don't expect all else skip or PLL skip that much, but it, it's more common than, let's say, LSE skip, you know? Yeah, so full skips are a bit more uncommon. Uh, LSE skip is one in, depending on how you count it, it's one in 2,000 or one in 4,000. Uh, I think with like one move or like one one or two moves to finish, it's one in 2,000 or maybe one in, two, one in 1,000. Um but that's not that important since you get small skips all the time. You'll get an EO skip, you'll get a ULUR skip, you'll get a mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get a two move EOLR, you'll get a four C skip. So if you get a couple of those in an average, you'll have you know a half second faster average. Um, CMLL skips are around one in a hundred, I think. Oh, um, that's not that's not exactly even. that's not like it seem it seems like it's not that terrible, but it's also not that common. But it seems like most people don't even benefit from CMLL skips that you'll kind of, a lot of people aren't really good at predicting CMLL from their, yeah. from their second block. So they'll get a CMLL skip pause, pause. for like 0.3 or yeah. 0.5 and then continue. Whereas they wish they just got a soon or like a, the six mover, uh, that sort of thing. <laughs> so uh, most of the really good averages or singles don't even have a CMLL skip in them. Yeah. And okay. This is another subject, but still, we had an interview with Fami and asked him, okay, what what do you do on the worst like on the worst scrambles? Because I know that Rue is re really prone to to like bad scrambles. If you get a bad one, it's it's really nerve wracking. If you see no blocks, if you see nothing connected, if you like, how do you even start to <laughs> deal with it? Yeah, I think I've seen his answer to that actually. From maybe yeah. it was another. I yeah, think, yeah, it yeah. was on the competition. Yeah, yeah, it was it's in the competition. Go back to I've basics. seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that. Um, I I think about that every day. Every time I get a bad scramble, I think about his answer. Um, I don't remember oh, really? what he answered. I, I I remember I I think about when he was asked that question. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something along the lines of just pick something and go with it and hope the rest of the solve is fine. But. If your inspection said good go at... back to basics with the four basics of the first block, which is line, half line, uh, square, like go from there and, and then build it. Yeah, I, it's very rare that you won't be able to see anything in terms of you won't be able to plan a block at all. You'll always find something, but it'll just be bad. And you just have to accept that this bad thing is, is the best you're going to find right now. And you mm. just have to look as far as you can, just make sure you execute it cleanly. And oftentimes the rest of the solve can be perfectly fine. Like I've turned garbage first blocks into fives or, or sixes or that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's a bit give and take, right? You have a, a bit more time to plan your second block while you're doing that turning. Um, so just the fact that it's a bad first block doesn't always mean it's going to be a, a bad solve. Like use it for look ahead. Why yeah, exactly. It's just totally not going to add some stress at the beginning of this all. <laughs> exactly, yeah. How many times do you see like a first block, a, a first block like in inspection, but you didn't see any blocks or something like you say, okay, this is genius. If I haven't like checked the moves out, I wouldn't have seen I like everything comes together because I've seen a few CFOP uh, crosses that, you say, okay, I've seen nothing connected, but then you see like a four or five move cross, which is amazing with plus one. How much do you see that in Rue? I'd say it's pretty pretty often. Um, there's a lot of just common patterns that you'll see in terms of how pieces are positioned or like, you know, the common F, F prime, F2, B, B prime, B2 of like the, where is the edge in terms of orientation and, you know, on the, on those faces if you see an edge is anywhere on the front face or the back face oriented properly to be inserted by you know f moves or b moves then that can end up being a really a really efficient block um oh. uh what, what else would i want and then yeah so any sort of even if you don't have a pair like a center connected to an edge is plenty to work off of anything that's one move away is plenty to work off of the only time that i think like it gets messy and you don't even want to look at it is when the DR edge is more than one move away from being solved with the center. No. Then, you know, then the rest of it has to be very convincing for you to want to go for that. 
or the DL edge, sorry. Yeah. So you just th this is one of the barometers for which color to pick the DL edge. Yeah, if the t typically unless I see a pair or something that's really really attractive for the rest of that block, if the DL edge is you know not oriented relative to the center, then I won't look at it. Okay, that's interesting. I always thought that true solvers would look for blocks or something like you said, like pairs or blocks, but the DL edge, right? Because regardless of whether you do pairs or uh, half lines or lines, the DL edge is always going to be part of it, yeah. right? Whether you do the whether you do the back square or the front square, in in hey, either it's the backbone, yeah, it's the backbone. So if that's like I'll, I'll always scan for like any sort of one by one by two, whether it's a pair or a half line or a center edge or anything. But if I've done that scan and there's nothing really that good, then I'll look for any pair or one by two that's one move away or any sort of pattern that's, you know, with the edges that I was talking about. And I'll consider the the DL if it's zero or one move to solve. I've also seen some, let's call it shenanigans with Rue solvers that they build the second block while doing the first, like preserve some kind of a block or a pair while doing it. Have you done that or yeah, you so, completely disregard? Or... Yeah, so maybe like 2016, we had this big discussion. It was me, Kevin, and Yuri where we were like, okay, there's all these different advanced ways of doing things. There's, you know, there's nonlinear blocks where you solve first block, second block at the same time, or like in a nonlinear way, you solve a square, you preserve a pair, you do that sort of thing. So it's nonlinear blocks. Then there's like non-matching blocks where you do white oh, bottom on that. one, yellow bottom on the other, or yeah. like... Uh, misoriented centers where you know you you orient things with the front center or back center on top in LSE. Then there's like uh, non-matching centers where you solve a block where everything's correct except for the center piece, and then you have to do like uh, UI. Oh, I've M seen that in one of Femi solves. That yeah. Oh, and and Sean's. I've seen it. I think it was the in Sydney. It was. Yeah, what probably. Was I I do world. a pretty. Yeah. Whenever everything else is easy, I I'll do it. Uh, and it's also a mistake I make sometimes, but it's an easy fix because three moves. But essentially, these these four techniques are, uh, you know, I think they should be used more now when people are pushing the limits. But they're really just tools that you uh, that people have generally only used when it's really obvious that it's going to benefit you. Um, in terms of nonlinear blocks, if you see that it's really easy to preserve a pair, or just add a few, add one or two moves to you know make a second block square. Uh, then that's really beneficial. But in terms of the initial planning and the first sort of things you look at in inspection, that's not really something anyone does quite yet. Yeah. Yeah, because usually what separates, as I see it, Rue and CFOB, that Rue should be less rigid. Like you actually need to block build and not stick to the you no know, rigid form of, of CFOB. And still today you see you see in CFOB people planning and, and toying with um, going out of the box with uh, pseudo crosses, with the uh, free fob. Yeah, with pseudo, keyhole, with, exactly. You know? Like keyhole's so, old, but even that's a, a bit of a departure from the standard way of solving pairs. Like, as you mentioned, the, the pseudo crosses, the keyhole, the block pseudo build. Pseudo pairs is pretty thing. much keyhole, if you think pseudo, about it. Yeah, yeah, pseudo pairs as well, exactly. Um, some people, Dwayne was talking about pseudo pairs for Rue. I think essentially the difference there is that CFOP has been pushed to the limit and to get faster, people need to really incorporate that. Whereas just doing standard Rue, block, block, CMLL, maybe EOLR, and then finish is plenty fast to be faster than CFOP one-handed and pretty close to it one, uh, wait, what did, what did I say? Faster one-handed, pretty close to yeah. it two-handed. So no one's really hit that wall where they can't just improve from improving their efficiency and turning and fluidity. I mean, technically it's what, 30 years younger as a method? Yeah. <laughs> so like, it, it's not that it hasn't been developed, like the tools are there. Um, everyone's commented on them and it's pretty clear like what the next steps would be, but I don't think anyone's good enough at the method to make it necessary to to really push push those limits yet. Or need those because- Yeah, or, seen... or even need it. Yeah, even on CFOP, you've seen people like, I think I've done a video about it. Like it was Patrick and then Felix and then Matty. All of them got a sub five solve and it was full step. It was, are you spam? It was like 60, 70 moves and okay, enough, no special method here. So 
maybe you need to work on fluidity, not you specifically, but anyone who's watching, yeah. work on fluidity, work on finger tricks, work on... Bas, you want to say something? No, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm copy pasting stuff. Uh, so I have one image that I find compelling uh, for this uh, for this topic, which is so this is the move count uh, on average, uh, you know, for two handed and one handed. Yep. Now we always talk about you know forty moves, forty five moves uh, as the average that Ru should have, etc. The reality of really fast Ru solvers is fifty moves. Yeah. So clearly just in terms of reaching what the method in terms of potential gives, uh, we're not there yet by a long shot. It's, yeah. You know, but then again, it comes, yeah, it's, it's out of balance, right? Like I think mine, I don't, I didn't add up mine, but I, I'm from what I know, I would guess it's 40, 47, 48. Um, and I just have a slower turning, more efficient style. Whereas someone like Sean and Dwayne have a, you know, faster turning, less efficient style. So this relates back to what Timon says, like everyone's got a style and a strength. And is it worth it for someone to sacrifice a bit of turning speed for a bit of efficiency or the other way around is, you know, debatable. Um, and it becomes a question of, you know, what are the human limits of how far can we push, how far can we push efficiency while keeping TPS high is really the question there. Yeah, definitely. Also, very good prediction on on your move count. It's yeah, it's basically forty seven. Yeah, forty seven three by three, forty six oh. six. That's pretty good. And then fifty four one handed, uh, which I'm pretty sure will just come down to that second block last pair and then CML. CML and the combination of the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, yeah. I've seen a few reconstruction where root solvers are doing the first block on front sometimes or rotating for first block. I, I think it was one of them was family and I asked him what, why? And I said, okay, it was better finger tricks and just rotate like a Y or something, which is nothing. Do, do you ever rotate at all or do you like keep it in the same axis? Because on upon pickup, at least for pickup, you can still play with an F and, and D or B, you know? How much do you, I, I know it's a rude word to say to a rude solver, how much do you rotate? Yeah, how much do I rotate? Maybe one in a hundred solves, maybe even more rare than that. I think it's like a pretty advanced technique to be able to decide whether the rotation's worth it for the slightly better finger tricks. And over the years, people have like developed ways of avoiding rotations even more. Uh, so instead of like solving the block with the center fixed on your left hand, and then yeah. solving the pieces around it, you'll hold like the BL edge fixed or you'll hold the uh, LBD corner fixed and then just do wide moves to solve everything around that. Uh, so that's a good way of avoiding rotations. I know Dwayne does that a lot, Yuri as well. Um, mm. Myself, I don't feel very stable doing wide moves a lot of the time. So I do have a bit of a bias of always keeping the center on my left and just preferring to build around it with D moves. Uh, but there are cases where I will do a rotation. I don't think I've ever done a Y or a Y prime in a solve. Um, it'll usually be a Z or a Z prime. Yeah. Or sorry, an X or an X prime. That's what I mean. With the pickup. Uh, not even in the pickup. Sometimes I'll do, like, I'll, I'll do it to do a, I'll start from an X prime away from, you know, standard. And just because I want to be able to, to do a B or a B prime or several yeah. of them. And then I'll just do an X after I'm done first block. Um, yeah, that's what I meant about pickup because if the F face is facing up, yeah, you know you can do F or B. And it oh yeah, like I yeah, or... I, I do it the other way with the the B face facing up. Oh, with the B. Yeah. Oh, right. You can but do very right. very rarely. Um, I did it. I think the only official solve I've done it in is was actually in the world record average. Maybe the the very last solve I think actually it might have been that. Where I, I couldn't find anything. The the only block I had planned was like was mainly like really a three by three or a two handed block. It wasn't really like one handed efficient in terms of ergonomics. And I just decided I'm just gonna do an X prime and do it from there. Nice. Um, how much do you practice with stack mat? I mean, like really comp style. Yeah, I mean back in the day between 2014 to 2019 it was just increasing exponentially at first i was doing almost all keyboard and then just stack them out a week out but 
over the years as I realized I need to work on my competition preparation, then it became almost exclusively stack mat. I do, I think 2017 to 2019, I did almost every solve with stack mat and oh, I, wow. I popularized the, the stack mat is cheating. I'd basically just comment stack mat is cheating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sorry, keyboard is cheating. <laughs> I'd, co keyboard. I'd comment <laughs> keyboard is cheating on anyone uploading, uh, uploading unofficial averages on keyboard. Um, but yeah, these days I I don't care. So I will I, I typically don't pull out a stack mat. How much does it affect you when you start with the grip with the timer? Like yes. I know with CFOP it affects a lot, but so I mean it depends how you start the cube. If you start two-handed holding the cube. Yeah. Uh honestly, okay. So it'll depend on what uh like if you like if you do a, a Felix style keyboard start where the cube is on the keyboard and your hands are on the space bar and mm -hmm. you just pretend it's a stack mat, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, I'll typically start with the cube in my left hand and then just move my right hand to the space bar. And since oh, it's root yeah. and I'm right-handed, I, I don't turn the cube until my hand gets here. Nice. But I can cheat it a little bit on LFC. I end up just like, go I, since I don't use my pinky, I'll just bring my pinky close to the space bar. And then the moment I finish that last like <laughs> M2 or whatever it is, I'll just stop With the uh... timer there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll do the last M2 while also like flicking the keyboard with my pinky. Um, so for two hand, it'll depend on your, your style and whether you can turn before you lift your hand up. Um, and also whether you're holding the cube, but the finish, I, I guess, is a bit, a bit more cheating since whatever you do in the middle of a turn, you can bring the cube close to the, to the, to the keyboard. For one hand, that again, it depends if you start the timer with your right hand or with your left hand. Um, I'm actually slower on keyboard one-handed than, than I am uh, on uh, on stack mat, just because. Um, you need to aim. Yeah, I start so when I do one-handed, I start the timer with my right hand, and I make sure like I don't hear the cube turning until the space bar sound has been made, obviously. Um, but then for stopping the timer, I never stop with my right hand. I'll, I'll drop the cube and stop with my left hand. Oh, nice. But getting getting the getting my hand from the stack mat, which is lower, to my keyboard, which is higher, takes time. Um, or like you know, because I need a mat for table of use to finish. So going from here to doing like an M two to lifting my hand up and going over to the keyboard takes a lot of time. And I'll I'll pretty often like hit my laptop the front the front ledge of it. So that so then, uh, but then when I do stack mat, I keep my right hand on the timer, and then as I do LSC, I move the cube back towards the towards the thing. So then the moment I finish the last move, my hand is already is already there. Nice. Um, for table abuse, and I'm not speaking about the MU LSC. Yep. Um, there are a lot of styles, at least with CFOP. I mean. I've seen, for example, Max is using the table almost exclusively, like for everything, and Felix or Patrick who just hold the cube and rarely. Um, how much do you see that in Ru that abusing during the first block or second block, abusing the table? I'd say uh, the the variation smaller in Ru in terms of how much you use the table during first and second block. Uh, overall, with CFOP solvers, it's just a matter of you know how you practiced your turning. As you were developing, whether you, you know, can quickly do Z like this, or yeah. whether you just, you know, depend on the table to stabilize the cube while doing rotations, whether it's Y or Z. Um, but for Rue, you're gonna need to use M slices during your second block. So we never really pick the cube up far away from the table. So mm. most people, when they're, you know, getting faster, they they will use the table to stabilize the cube or align a layer quickly, that sort of thing. Um, obviously we don't, we don't really rotate, but I think most people do use the table in first and second block, not, not only just to do M moves, but also just to help stabilize just because we all learned with, you know, the cube really close to the table to be ready to do an M move when we need to. So then it's just a bit of a habit that people develop to use it to stabilize as well when needed. Interesting. Um, another painful thing, tell me if I'm offensive, how much do you dnf on m moves <laughs> um i mean or is official, it a common myth you know yeah, like uh, in official solves it'll happen once every comp oh really wow yeah i think so, so. yeah with uh, every resolver or with you like, with me with me i think i get oh. one one per comp probably uh but again like 
if you get a plus two, I think CFOP solvers plus two rates aren't aren't that amazing either. Yeah. People plus two pretty often. It's just you you rush a little bit, you get a bit too excited, stop the timer. Um either way, the average is probably dead in most cases. So um yeah. Yeah, still it's a DNF, like with yeah, DNF, that's painful. I've seen that a couple of times, it was heartbreaking. You're being too harsh on yourself. Just Me? looking, yeah. Is it yeah. not quite every competition? No, no, no. It's like one every ten. But one every ten solves or one every ten competitions? One every ten rounds. One every ten rounds? Well, that's almost every that's basically every comp, right? Because if there's three rounds of Yeah, so it's <laughs> one every second comp, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. There's three rounds of wait, one every ten rounds, sorry. Okay. Every ten, yeah. So every ten rounds. Every yeah, two yeah, and yeah. a half comps. Every two and a half like, comps. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's good. Okay. Right. <laughs> Maybe every two comps if you if it's like three rounds of three and one or two rounds of OH. Yeah. How do you deal with such a thing? Like you brush it off, go to the next one or slow so, so slower, finish I mean, slower? Or... Yeah, I end up typically just going safety mode after I get a, a DNF. But for me, safety mode, I end up solving faster. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at it actually. Uh, we drew, most of, yeah. Most of your fastest solves come after a DNF. Yep, exactly. My last competition, I got a DNF on solve three in finals, I think. And then I got two low sixes afterwards. Yeah. Um, I, I, my style is just, I, I have to, in when I do official solves, the world kind of speeds up, or sorry, the world slows down. And it feels like I'm, you know, turning normally, but I'm turning incredibly fast, way too fast for my style. I'll lock up too much. I'll, I'll make mistakes, miss solutions. And for, for me to do well officially, I really just have to purposely turn as slow as I can. And just just focus on being efficient and it, it really bothers me when there's cfop solvers spamming tps and i feel like i have to turn as fast as them uh so i just have to always remind myself to slow down so that's why after i get a dnf i'll just say okay i'll i'll do a safety solve and then just finish the average and i'll typically end up solving faster and then i'll remember oh i was supposed to be doing that the whole time yeah i've spoken with a few let's call it senior like me um solvers and one of the common problem is that we don't i say we like the few that are spoken with we don't um i don't want to say spam tps but we don't uh let's take it from the uh athletics department we don't sprint we do yeah. a marathon you know what i mean mm -hmm. and instead of like spamming the tps on the ol and pll we we just like uh let's do a marathon and and like do it fast but still in in a in a way that you can it's like a comfortable controlled way that you're used yeah, to yeah yeah you're not going to you trip up and stumble there is more like that i think my style is a lot more like that um i don't really like do bursts of tps and then do a little pause or slow down exactly. i i do best when i'm just fluid calm and just a slow controlled turning style uh, i think that's also just due to my hands being clumsy uh if i if i try to force tps I'll, i'll make a lot of mistakes drop the cube do an extra move that i wasn't supposed to um other solvers like Dwayne and sean can really spam and, and push their tps and do fine uh but i'm personally just not like that i think it's just a, a individual style difference Yeah, a former world record holder saying he's clumsy. That's <laughs> <laughs> ironic, but yeah, it's amazing that you can like get amazing results and still not sprint. Like you can say, okay, if I'm efficient enough, if I'm on point, I'll get every algorithm. If I get everything like right, I'll I'll get a good result, which is something that you don't normally see on on speed solving. It's more yeah, exactly. like spam the algorithm, do it as fast. I can do this algorithm in this point, this second. And in in rule, so it's super important to be efficient as I see it, right? Yeah. And uh, kind of the slowing down to go faster relates to what I said earlier about like time slowing down when you're doing official solves. Kind of the, the fight or flight response of the, the high stimulation environment kind of makes you so hyper-focused that... It, You know, sometimes I do a solve officially and it feels like a nine and then it's six. Uh, oh, I, I remember Timon talks about this as well. He always says his, his perception of time gets messed up when he solves officially. And it feels like he's going so slow and that sort of thing. But then you look at the video and he's solving super quickly and then it's a four. So uh, 
it affects different people to different extents. But for me, especially like I feel so slow or my, my solves will feel so slow when I do them right. And then the time will be fine. Almost an out of body experience. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so it's easy. You just need to push your brain in overdrive. And then, you know, it goes by itself. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't think that's just solve like Max says. <laughs> yeah, nice. I unfortunately need to, need to go. Uh, there's oh. a six-month little one that needs, <laughs> uh, that needs to sleep. But uh, uh, it, it was fantastic. So thanks a lot for this. Yeah, thank, can, thank you so much. Thank you, Basilio. About that, but it was really great. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on and all your great questions. Okay. And thanks for everything you do for the community as well. The same to you. Thank you, Basilio. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Ciao, ciao. Right. Have a good night.